Hello and welcome. It is the season of change here at Salt Lake City Government. And this week's episode is all about fond memories and farewells. After hosting Capital City News for nearly a decade, the time has come for me to embark on a new career adventure, and this will be my last episode. It has been an absolute honor and privilege bringing you the latest in city government news. Thank you viewers of Salt Lake City for tuning in over the years. On our episode this week, we celebrate the retirement and visionary work of Vicki Bennett, who led the city's award-winning SLC Green sustainability programs for two decades. We'll also hear from the mayors that she worked with. This month is also Asian Pacific Islander American Heritage Month, and our History Minute sheds light on the Asian immigrant experience with the story of Taijiro Kasugo and in the creation of the 20th century strawberry. Let's get started with our legislative update and look back. The City Council reviewed the Mayor's proposed budget for the next fiscal year and received informational updates on important topics including the pandemic, homelessness in Salt Lake City, and racial equity in policing. At its special May 13th meeting, the City Council chose Dennis Ferris as the interim replacement for Andrew Johnston as the council member for District 2. To learn more, visit slc.gov council. The Salt Lake City Council has determined that ranked choice voting will be used for the 2021 municipal election. Be sure to keep an eye on our channels for more information on how it will work and how you can vote. En un incendio doméstico, solamente tienes dos minutos para escapar. Es por eso que la Cruz Roja Americana quiere que tu familia practique un simulacro de escape en dos minutos y prueba tus alarmas de humo una vez por mes. Visite soundthealarm.org para programar su cita educativa virtual gratuita sobre seguridad contra incendios en el hogar. Recuerda, activa tu alarma. Visita soundthealarm.org. Green Bike, the nonprofit bike share program in Salt Lake City, is now offering $1 annual passes for essential workers, healthcare heroes, and those who have been heavily impacted by the COVID 19 pandemic. To learn more about eligibility and to sign up for a 2021 pass, visit greenbikeutah.org slash COVID 19. From inception to creation, Vicki Bennett has led one of the most ambitious, award-winning and broad-reaching sustainability agendas in the country and across four mayoral administrations. This month, Salt Lake City celebrates the retirement of Vicki Bennett as Salt Lake City's Director of Sustainability. Check out her story and hear from the four mayors, both past and present, about working with Vicki throughout the years. I've been with the city for 20 years, and when I was first hired, I was hired as the environmental manager. <clears throat> and I was the first person in the city who had that title, um, generally looking at all the environmental issues, but at the same time, this topic of sustainability kept coming up. So the idea that it was more than just being an environmentalist, but you also had to look long-term to make sure that everything we did also helped the economy or didn't negatively affect the economy and that we were looking at things in an equitable manner. And that was the whole, you know, kind of definition of sustainability. We were starting to realize that there was a real benefit to doing long-term planning in that way, had to do with climate change and energy policy. And so we became a division under public services when Mayor Becker came in to office in 2007, and then we became a department eight years later when Mayor Biskupski came into office. In your tenure, it seems like Salt Lake City has been a leader in sustainability um, in the state and in the nation. Can you talk about how we've set an example under your watch? That's, I think, been so exciting, especially working on the national level. We had, were one of the first sustainability departments, divisions in the nation. And in 2007, about 12 cities got together and we started talking to each other saying, what is this sustainability definition? How are we going to really use it in our cities? We were able to get funding as a group, grow a 
what started as a small organization, the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, and there's now 230 cities that are members. We, by being a leader, Salt Lake City has been invited to do so many things, gotten funding for things like our building energy benchmarking ordinance, our building electrification projects, a lot of our equity work. Uh, because of our leadership, quite often it wasn't a situation of us going and trying to compete for funds. They came to us and said, you're leading in these areas. Here's some funding. Do you want to be part of this solution with us? Uh, locally, we've had the opportunity to implement a lot of these things and then see other cities in the region follow us. I mean, from simple things like we were the first city to have any sort of recycling program. And now you can't imagine a city in the region not having a recycling program. We had the first ordinance prohibiting idling in the city and many other cities in the Wasatch Front area now have that same ordinance. Sometimes we were the ones who just stuck our necks out, but we certainly found that other cities followed once we set the example. So much of thinking about sustainability is trying to imagine uh, the future and imagine what our impacts on the future are going to be. The city has been very fortunate to have you working for it, but you're you're retiring soon. And I'm wondering, as you look to the future of Salt Lake City and sustainability uh, and your retirement, what seeds have you been able to plant that you're excited to watch bear fruit more from, from the sidelines or from retirement or from a beach somewhere? <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, some of the seeds are ones that are, I guess you could call them, you know, infrastructure, technical things like the renewable energy program we've created and the fact that we'll have 100% community renewable energy by 2030. And the ordinances and laws that we've seen passed at the state level to make that happen. Uh, I think the most important seed, if you wanna talk about what I feel like we've grown is our team and our staff. I'm retiring knowing that Salt Lake City is in great hands. Uh, the people who are working in our de department are second to none, they're national leaders. They know what needs to be done and they're coming in with new ideas that are so exciting. So I really feel like we're being left in an excellent position. And that's part of the reason I don't feel too guilty going to find a beach to sit on. As you look back over the years that you've been at the, the city and you've been working on sustainability issues, if you had to point to one thing that you felt uh, you were most personally invested in or most proud of, what would that, what would that be over your time here? I think the one thing that you know, I could really look back at and say, boy, that was something I would have never gotten any other way was when we were invited, partly because our, through our sustainability director network connections to be on the White House Climate Task Force. And Mayor Becker was the official member of that under President Obama. But, you know, I was able to be there as staff with him and attend a series of meetings with the president and get to meet him and really see how invested he was in approaching you know, all of the climate issues and ensuring that we're looking at what we could do to minimize climate change. And you, know, you just can't even start to you know, realize how fortunate you are to sit in the room with the president of the United States and discuss these issues and know that your work is really making a difference. It really brings home the idea that all politics are local. It really does. I mean, and that's why I've really enjoyed working with the city is that we, you know, we are working with our residents and, you know, the things that we do affect them the most and we can help them in the, you know, the best ways. And it's so exciting to be able to drive to work in the morning and look at things. And you know, I look at the public safety building and the fact that it's a net zero building. And I remember the discussion I had with an energy engineer at a conference when we first were talking about creating and you know, the, building the public safety building and saying, let's see if we could make it net zero. And it happened. You know, and you know that you had some you know, some real influence on the things that are happening here. 
for residents that are watching this and and really interested in trying to see how they can do their part to ensure that legacy of sustainability that you've helped build the foundation for what would you what would be your advice for them or where would you send them to to go for more information well we have of course all of our programs are in you know discussed in great depth on our website slcgreen.com and that's probably the best starting point. They can see where they can be involved and see what sorts of ideas we have. We really do want residents to be able to give us their thoughts. And you know, they're the ones who quite often lead the way on some of these things that we're trying to, you know, the ideas and programs we're trying to implement. So that would be where I recommend they be. Vicki's traveled around the world with every mayor that she served and made a name for Salt Lake City as one of the most progressive, environmentally sustainable, and resilient cities in the world. Vicki is well known. She's received so many accolades locally, but really across the country and beyond. And I think that her legacy is known uh, far beyond Salt Lake City and the benefit, the environmental impacts for sure are going to outlast all of us. Vicki was extraordinary. She was committed. She was highly competent, very conscientious, and always a real joy to work with. We were always on the same track, and I laid out a very ambitious agenda and was always adding to it. And she never complained. Not only did she not complain, it seemed like she embraced the job with real gusto. And we became uh, the city with the most comprehensive environmental and especially climate protection programs in the country. She shaped things by being so capable and getting things done as much as anything else. And, you know, as, as someone in office who was looking to really push the envelope of what we could do, um, in the whole range of sustainability matters. She had to reach a long ways, you know, to help figure out and how to get things done. And, and she was terrific at it. Well, I think we're all very fortunate that Vicki pursued the career steps that she took uh, to help lead our state, uh, not just our city, but our state uh, into doing what is right on behalf of the environment and we will all be very, very grateful to her leadership to her mentorship of her team and the the new leaders that will rise in that team and continue her legacy and the work that's been done um, but i know people all across this country are very grateful that she stepped up and led when she did and how she did and we're all going to be better for it there's not a solar project, an electric vehicle charging center, a clean emission technology built into our buildings, a net zero fire station, our clean airport that's happened. There's nothing in this city that is environmentally sustainable that doesn't have Vicky's fingerprints on it. So I can't name a single thing that will be emblematic necessarily of Vicky's time with us because it's everything. Next up is our History Minute. Taijiro Kasuga immigrated to Utah in 1895 from Japan. He took on various odd jobs, including one as a cook at the Alta Mine, but soon he turned to farming to make ends meet with his family. Strawberries were a valuable crop in Utah, but he was dissatisfied with the quality of strawberries he could find. So he sent a letter to the Agriculture Department asking for instructions on how to crossbreed plants, they sent him back a manual, and over the next decade, he worked to develop a brand new strawberry. The result was called the ever-bearing 20th century strawberry. The patent on this new strain made Kasuga a millionaire, but that did not protect him from prejudice. In the 1940s, the Kasuga family farm was at the mouth of Little Cottonwood Canyon and had a pipeline that would allow the Kasuga family access to the valley's water supply. This bred distrust from the racist locals, assuming that the Kasuga's Japanese ancestry would lead them to somehow poison the water supply. Taijiro and his family were forced to relocate, and they eventually resettled in Sandy. The 20th century strawberry is no longer in common use across the country, though its descendant, the Ozark Beauty, is still regularly grown. 
Taijiro Kasuga passed away at the age of 84 in 1964. Thank you for watching Capital City News with me as your host over the years. To continue to stay connected with Salt Lake City government, follow at SLCGov on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Nextdoor. Again, thank you residents of Salt Lake City for tuning in. Please stay safe and take care. Signing off as my last episode, I'm Poonam Kumar with SLC TV.